In 1918, following the Russian Revolution in 1917, the region of Bessarabia was integrated into the country currently known as Romania. The Soviet Union caused Romania to give up Bessarabia up to the USSR as a separate country known as the Moldovian Soviet Socialist Republic in the 1940s. On the fateful year of 1991, when the Soviet Union dissolved into the countries we know today, the MSSR declared independence and had taken the name Moldova. However, in the process of its independence, there was a decrease in industrial and agricultural output. The service sector had grown to dominate Moldova's economy and is over 60% of the nation's GDP. Its economy is the poorest in Europe and has the lowest human development index in the continent. Moldova is also the least visited country in Europe by tourists, with only 11,000 annually recorded visitors from abroad. So why visit? Why explore a country famously known for being unpopular and unrecognized? It is because I strongly believe that a country's worth cannot be determined solely based on statistics and history. Every country has something to offer to the people and come to visit, and Moldova is no exception. On my journey exploring the ins and outs of this country, I've come across incredible things. And today, I'm going to share those things with you. To understand what makes a country and a city, one must know a bit about the history that made it. We might read things online, but the thoughts of individuals who live to tell the tale is what matters in the end. When it comes to explaining a young man's life in a falling Soviet society, Alexander Kurochkin has some interesting things to say. Ой, Тимур, такой вопрос, прямо ты знаешь, на него ответить вот так вот, насколько сложно. Я, во-первых, не историк, а история, то, что происходит практически сейчас на глазах, скажем так, довольно-таки плачевно. Ну и то, что вот происходило до того, как мое детство, это когда был еще Советский Союз, и Молдова входила в состав Советского Союза. То есть... Я могу сказать больше не историю, а как бы социальные какие-то. Как это... как Жили, как и все, то есть это было неплохо. Почему? Потому что было на тот момент при Союзе довольно хорошее социальное обеспечение. То есть политика велась в сторону народа. То есть люди на тогда, где-то до конца 80-х годов, не было такого беспокойства за завтрашний день, потому что это все было систематично, это все было защищено. То есть, ну как вот, родился, пошел в детский сад. Сколько-то там. Пришло время идти в школу, пошел в школу, закончил школу. Дальше была учеба в технику. Значит, если бы на тот момент Советский Союз не распался, то отслужил в армию. Ну и дальше уже как либо пошел бы дальше учиться, либо работать. Chisinau, the city that Mr. Kroshkin lived in, has clearly experienced a lot of development that he himself had witnessed with his own eyes. It all started when there was a rapid population growth in the 1950s, to which the Soviet administration responded by constructing large-scale housing and palaces in the style of Stalinistic architecture. The new architectural style brought about a dramatic change and generated the style that dominates today. With large blocks of flats arranged in considerable settlements, currently the share of dwellings built during the Soviet period represents 74% of the total households. Now, some argue that Soviet architecture is very bland and uninspired, but do the city's landmarks and monuments hold to that testimony? Located on the Great National Assembly Square is a great arch that was built in 1940 by the architect Ayazo Shevik, commemorate the victory of the Russian Empire over the Ottoman Empire during the Russo-Turkish War. From its construction to 2011, the monument sheltered at its second level a huge bell of nearly 6,400 kilograms. The bell, called Pot Belikan, was initially made for the cathedral's belfry, but happened to be too big for it. Finally, it was installed in this arch, which was designed in purpose. Not far off is the central park of Chisinau, a statue of Pushkin who used to stroll the park grounds in the early 1820s, was designed by Russian sculptor Alexander Avakushin and erected in 1885 in the park center making Chisinau the second city after Moscow to have a Pushkin monument. Originally funded by Chisinau inhabitants at a price of a thousand golden rubles, it is the oldest surviving monument in the city. 
It was followed up by construction of the statue of Stefan Selman at the park's entrance in 1928. In 1958, the avenue of classic modern literature was opened, lined with statues and busts of Romanian and Moldovan authors and social figures. Avenue included famous figures as Alexander Hadju, George Kozbak, Mihai Eminusu, Nicole Milescu, Tudor Argesi, so as many others. Now, one can only go so far with landmarks and we must go further into the love and culture of the Moldovian people. And as Astia Filipashka, a young talented woman, tells us more about what makes Moldovan people who they are. <laughs> Miss Filipashka had actually launched the youth organization that prioritizes the involvement of youth in local politics. A brilliant achievement and during the celebration, we got to see a lot of brilliant and traditional song and dances of Moldovian culture. After experiencing such an amazing event, we headed to a traditional restaurant serving the finest of Moldovan cuisine. Perhaps the best known Moldovan dish is the well known Romanian dish, Amolika. This is a staple polenta like food, served alongside stews and meat dishes or garnished with cottage cheese, sour cream, or pork rind. Regional delicacies include branza, a brine cheese, and giveshi, a lamb or goat stew. Local vines accompany most meals. Meat products hold a special place in traditional Moldovan cuisine, especially as an appetizer or the first course. Roasted and grilled pork, beef meatballs and steamed lamb are common. After enjoying a fine meal, we headed to our last destination, the city's national children library, Ion Kranga. It's a library that provides a large variety of books to schools and individual children all across Chisinau. It educates young people by providing information and constantly hold interesting and engaging activities to make sure that the children get the most out of their time there. After a long day of exploring, I wanted to hear my father's and his friends' opinion on what they think of this city. I have come with me to encourage people to join and participate in their fascinating guild and to explore the wonders of Moldova alongside <laughs> Moldovan culture, however, is not just composed in its capital, Chisinau. It has a lot more to offer beyond the city limits. A 
first stop outside of Chisinau was the city of Soroco. Found far north of Chisinau is one of the most ancient places in the country, with a lot of landmarks worth visiting. This fort right here is known as the Soroco Fort. The original wooden fort was an important link in the chain of fortifications, which comprised four forts, one of the Desir, two forts on the Danube, and three forts on the north border of the medieval Moldova during the Middle Ages. Between 1543 and 1546, under the rule of Petru Rares, the fortress was rebuilt in stone as a perfect circle with five bastions situated at equal distances. Afterwards, during the Great Turkish War, John Sebeski's forces successfully defended the fortress against the Ottomans. The stronghold was sacked by the Russians in the Russo-Turkish War. The Soroko Fortress is an important attraction in Soroka, having preserved the culture and kept the old Soroka in present. Soroko is also famous for its Gypsy Hill. Amid the broken sidewalks and barely paved roads, Roma residents build elaborate houses, inspired by and borrowing architectural flourishes from famous buildings in wealthier countries including St. Peter's Basilica, the US Capitol Building and the Bolshoi Theatre. Among the mansions is the true home of true royalty, the Gypsy King Arthur Chirari. On Gypsy Hill, some of the mansions are unfinished, others lack creature comforts like indoor plumbing and electricity. Many are large enough to house dozens of people but may remain empty for long stretches of time while their owners are earning money elsewhere. Regardless of what these mansions are or are not, a stroll through the neighborhood is an eye-popping experience, juxtaposing real Eastern European poverty with knock-ups of wealthier worlds and ideas of what it means to have status. The last attraction of the city is the incredible Candle of Soroka, a tall tower somewhat resembling the Sauron's tower from Lord of the Rings. The monument was initially designed by Ion Druta. It stands at around 29.5 meters tall and symbolizes a candle that pays tribute to the anonymous heroes who have preserved the culture, language, and history of Moldova. The light of the candle can be seen at night from Oltasi in the north and Kamenka in the south. After this, we had visited a part of Moldova that was a little bit tricky to get into, and that was the unrecognized state of Moldova known as Transnistria. It all began back in 1941, following the Axis invasion of the Soviet Union. The city was taken over by Romanian troops. During the occupation, Transpol was under Romanian administration. During that period, almost all of its Jewish population died, were either killed or deported to Nazi death. On January 27, 1990, the citizens in Tiraspol passed a referendum declaring the city as an independent territory. The nearby city of Bendry also declared its independence from Moldova. As the Russian-speaking independent movement gained momentum, some local governments banned together to resist pressure from the Moldovan government from nationalization. The population of the city rested at about 190,000 in 1989 and about 203,000 in 1992, where 41% were Russians, 32 were Ukrainians, and 18 were Moldovans. Traspol was an interesting city, which differed to its counterpart back in Moldova. The Soviet monument and architecture was a lot more prominent here, unlike back in Chisinau, where the European culture is beginning to take place. After leaving Traspol and all it had to offer, we left Tunisia and drove back to Chisinau. To my surprise, there was one last place for us left to see, and it was incredible. It began when we arrived to the edge of a cliff with a view of a small town known as Old Orphan. Just below the huge hall, there was a town. The hall itself resembled a crater, and it was amazing, nevertheless. After enjoying the view from above, we went down into the city to experience the town's beauty for ourselves. The ancient city of Old Jorge is a natural, historical complex located in a narrow bend of the Tarout River. It contains traces of different civilization, including remnants of earthed and wooden fortresses that existed during the 6th to 1st century BC. The Moldovian town of Orhe itself dates from the 14th to 16th century. The Orthodox monastery is still inhabited by a handful of Orthodox monks, who remain the church at the top of the hill. Caves are still functional as chapels. They contain an array of historical artifacts and the old church Slavonic inscriptions dating back to the 1690s, which testified that the Hajduks took shelter in the caves, hiding from the Ottoman Empire. 
and finally this journey comes to an end. I hope you had a chance to see Moldova in a new light. This point, oh, despite all you had read or heard about it, it is a country worth visiting nevertheless, with interesting history dating all the way back to the Middle Ages, modern monuments that remind us of the Soviet rule of the country. Its landmarks and cultures is even inspiring and it has something to do to offer to everyone who visits. People here are nice and generous, and that's reflected in the way tourists are treated. Moldova is definitely a country you mustn't overlook.